2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 5. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I want to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth, but I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need, my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If you could pray with me. Lord, thank you so much that today you've given us an opportunity to come together um, and worship you and fellowship with one another and learn pray that you would open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear, Lord, that you'd show us what you have for us in your word today. And Lord, thank you so much for uh, letting us all be here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, if I haven't met you yet, uh, my name is Trey. I get to be one of the pastors here, so i um, happy that you're here with us this morning. Uh, I love uh, this passage of Scripture. Uh, it's given me a lot of really great comfort in a lot of periods of life. Um, for those of you that are new, uh, I've struggled with depression and anxiety like most of my life, and so this passage has been one that is uh, incredibly comforting. Um, and if I'm honest, the sentiment behind it can be rather frustrating. Uh, in the sense of sometimes when you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray with faith and you ask God to do something, and then for whatever reason he doesn't, uh, that can be uh, sometimes rather frustrating if I'm, if I'm honest. Uh, but this is a passage I come back to often. Uh, when I'm trying to understand pain, uh, I'm walking through. This, uh, there's a similar story elsewhere uh, in the life of Jesus. Uh, and when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he goes and he pleads with the Father three times. Like, Father, if you're willing, take this cup of suffering from me, but not my will, but yours be done. As outlined in Matthew 26, Jesus told his disciples, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Why? Why was Jesus feeling this way? Jesus being perfect, being fully God, fully man. Like, why, why was he feel this way? Because uh, I feel like sometimes f for me, there's uh, an undergirding sentiment that if God is calling you to do something, you should just be like totally excited about it, right? Like, oh, this sounds amazing. I can't wait. I look forward to it. Why was Jesus feeling this way? Uh, did he do something wrong? Was he lacking faith? If he had enough faith, wouldn't he have been excited to do what was in store for him. As I mentioned, uh, for me, like having more uh, chronic uh, de depression, um, I know at times for me, like it not going away, felt like I didn't trust God enough because if I trusted him enough, surely I'd be able to like tap into the spiritual plane and only feel joy and excitement, which would be really frustrating when that wasn't my lived experience most of the time. You may be here uh, dealing with some form of chronic pain. Maybe that's physical pain. Uh, maybe that's emotional pain. Maybe that's relational pain. Uh, sometimes our pain and suffering isn't an evidence of lack of faith. It may actually be precisely the avenue that God wants to demonstrate who he is. Sometimes there's this undergirding assumption that if you have faith or confidence in God, then you won't feel sad. God's good. Other people have it worse. Why do you feel bad? Uh, I don't know, uh, this is somewhat conjecture, but I wonder if at times Jesus would respond to this type of response by addressing us with, oh, you of little faith. Deep faith does not ignore or downplay pain. Deep faith allows space for pain and hope. Naming and acknowledging our pain for what it is actually can be a profound act of faith. Labeling the darkness makes the light all the more beautiful. And if we ignore pain, it's likely to ooze out of us and inflict pain on others as well. But if we acknowledge it, we're able to recognize our desperate need for God 
and are more prone to seeing his presence with us. Um, I also just don't know, uh, I don't know who needs to hear this, but the fact that you have pain uh, is like emotional pain is just a sign that you care. Uh, the fact that you're sad or you feel anxious or you are feeling overwhelmed is a sign that you care about something. Uh, I'm going to get into this later in this message, but God feels things, and we are made in his image, so it makes sense that we feel things too. Now, certainly our feelings get out of whack, and there are times that I get angry about things I shouldn't get angry about, and times I don't get angry about the things I should get angry about. There's times that our feelings get all sorts of out of, out of whack, but your pain uh, is a sign that you care. Uh, what I'm not going to do in this message, just to make it clear, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to remove your suffering from you. Hopefully you probably, you probably know that, and I'm not going to claim that I can. I will pray that God would do that for you. I pray that there are people in this room that um, even just in the time of us gathering together and proclaiming the name of Jesus, that there's some profound sense of healing that surpasses anything I'm able to say or that we're able to talk about together. I pray that that happens for you. But for others of us in this room, it's probably going to be similar to what Paul has, uh, where you plead with the Lord three times about it, or if you're like me, way more than three times. I mean, seriously, I've shared the story some here before, but since we've got some uh, new faces, so I was in student ministry before we started this church. I mean, a number of times I would just pray and pray and pray and pray and ask God that this stuff would stop. And I would go home and I would just like bawl my eyes out. I couldn't change the way that I felt. And it's frustrating at times. So my hope for this message is that it's actually a reassurance of what it is that God promises us. What we're invited into with the relationship with Jesus and what God can do with our suffering and why that is actually good news. Because to be honest, the Christian message about suffering is one of my most hopeful and like favorite things about my faith. So a little background on this passage that we just read. We are finishing up a series on 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians was a letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. And a big theme uh, in this passage is, or in this whole book, is power and weakness. And that's certainly the case here. The power of God demonstrated through the cross that now the symbol that was of evil, torture, pain, capital punishment turns into a beacon of hope and life. But also in Paul's own life, where he would see the things that made him weak actually were things that he could come to boast about because the same God who rose Jesus from the dead is able to bring beauty out of ashes, life out of death in us. And right before this passage, another theme kind of in the book is Paul is critiquing some other church uh, and Christian leaders who've come into Corinth. And I shared on this a couple weeks ago, but they were doing a number of things, but they were coming in, maybe even proclaiming a true message, uh, but doing it not for the sake ultimately of Jesus's name being known, but doing it to drag attention to themselves. I think one place called them uh, peddlers for God's word or something along those lines in chapter, I think that was in chapter two. In addition to that, they were belittling the Apostle Paul. And so Paul, right before this, gives a list of things he could boast about, being a Hebrew, suffering for Christ. There's this interesting thing that we didn't read about, being caught up into heaven, whether he was in body or out of body, he doesn't know. Um, very interesting kind of uh, talk that he's doing there. But he says in chapter 12, verse 1, that this boasting will do no good. Instead, he will boast in his weaknesses. Why not? Why will that boasting not do any good? He tells us, I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Or as another version says, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me. In other words, Paul is not interested in self-promotion for the sake of self-promotion. Uh, he's not in this just to proclaim, oh, look at me, I'm Paul, you can trust me because I know my Bible really well, you can trust me because of the letters I've written, you can trust me because, well, that's not what Paul's getting at. Uh, here he seems to be defending his ministry because people are belittling it, but his purpose is not that you would come to know Paul and love Paul and appreciate Paul's like, ability to speak and like, do all this stuff, that's not it at all. His purpose is that people would know Jesus and that Jesus would be made known. In all that he does, it's meant to point back to the person of Jesus. And I was literally having a conversation with someone uh, at lunch on Friday that was just talking about this uh, regular problem that can happen um, for a lot of us, and I think particularly for those of us in ministry, uh, where we stop making it about God, and instead we do it to make it about ourselves. And in, in, honestly, it's a tricky line uh, to navigate when you're in a public sort of profession. How do I proclaim the name of Jesus uh, while not drawing attention to myself ultimately? 
But, but the whole point is that in all that I do and all that we do, we are to seek the name of Jesus above our own. And then we get to this. In uh, verse 7, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. So we get to one thing that suffering does. Uh, It keeps us from becoming proud. Uh, And all God's people said, amen. Uh, I mean, seriously, you could have everything going well in your life, and if you are walking through something that is incredibly painful, whether that's in your body, an emotional thing, or like relationships with someone, it doesn't matter. And then it's super frustrating because you also like belittling yourself because I should feel better than I do. Paul tells us one thing suffering does do. It keeps us from becoming proud. I'm like, okay, I, it's cool, I'm good. Uh, let's pass that one along. I'm done with that one now. Thanks, God. Learned my lesson. I mean, I mean, seriously, like, uh, I remember just, like, being in, in student ministry and uh, where, where I was, like, with this, like, chronic period of depression that I realized I struggled with my whole life. And I would pray that God would help me not just make it through the next day, but, like, through the next, like, 10 minutes. And usually uh, I would make it through that period and not, like, break down and have a panic attack, except, like, one time I did. But usually it would be, like, immediately after the thing was done. And I would get frustrated with God, too, uh, because I was like, okay, I asked you for 15 minutes, but I didn't really mean 15 minutes. I meant more like forever. Like, let's just make this all stop. But it reminded me of my humanity and my desperate need for God. It wasn't until then that I think these words, like, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness and for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, I didn't understand those until then. Arguably, I still don't understand them. But it moved from here into my body. And so Paul says he was given this thorn in the flesh, a messenger, depending on your translation, it would say of or from Satan, to torment him or harass him and keep him from becoming proud. So Paul is talking about this thing that he has had for some time. It was given to him at some point that still presently torments him, harasses him, beats him up. It's a regular source of pain and discomfort. This is pain for Paul that's not of the past. Um, You know, I've I've talked about this often here, but sometimes I think uh, in churches and other places, we like to come about it from like, here's this thing I used to deal with, and praise God, I did these three things, and it's no longer there, and if you do these three things, it's all going to be better. Paul says, I did these three things and it didn't work the way I wanted it to. I prayed three times and it didn't go away. So what is Paul dealing with here? What is his thorn in the flesh? Uh, The honest answer is we don't know. Uh, There's a number of theories and ideas that have been uh, proposed. Some people think it's a physical illness of some sort. Other people assume it's a psychological problem. Other people say it's his opponents in ministry. Uh, The point is, though, whatever it is, it's a regular source of discomfort for Paul and seems to be regularly harassing him, beating him up. And I think it's actually kind of uh, hopeful for me and comforting that we don't know what it is. Because I think that allows space for all of our unique pain points in life to be our unique thorn in the flesh. I don't know what Paul's is, and I may not know what yours is, but chances are we all have that thing in our life that for whatever reason won't go away. And so what does Paul do? He prays to God about it. He pleads with God, begs him. Like Jesus in the garden, he prays three times, asking God to change it, to get rid of it. And I can only imagine what this must have been like for Paul based on my own uh, experience of praying much more than three times about something and asking him to change it. But before we get to that, uh, about what the uh, encouraging message is that he hears, we learn one important response to suffering, to pray, to ask God to do something, to ask God to remove it. Um, We are uh, getting ready to uh, start groups in a couple weeks, and one of the groups that we're offering is a group called Alpha, uh, which is really aimed at people Uh, to have a safe place to explore faith and talk about uh, various things. And they have uh, one uh, session, one video that they did on healing uh, and praying over people for healing, which was a fascinating video. And, you know, I saw that and I was like, oh, no, are they going to go about it and say, like, everybody gets healed? But one of the main stories that they told, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Israel, you've done Alpha more than I have, um, was of a man who had a chronic illness who regularly prayed over other people for healing, who never felt healing for himself, but saw healing in other people. I, 
I think there are two sort of negative responses we have when it comes to praying for pain to go away. Uh, One uh, would be to assume prayer will definitely get you what you want. That if I pray about it, and if I pray about it for you, if you have enough faith, praise God, it's going to be removed from you. As far as the east is from the west, God wants you to be healed, and it will be done for you right now in Jesus' name. Maybe. I hope that happens for you. I really do. That's not been my lived experience in my own life. But the other negative response that I think is uh, more prone for a number of us is to not pray. Because we think it won't work. Um, And there's a number of reasons for this. Maybe we've seen people... uh, assume prayer would work for people and use it and harm others. And so we don't want to inflict the same pain. I get that. I resonate with that one. Uh, Another maybe more deeply psychological issue that if you're like me, you may also struggle with is I'm scared to pray because if God, if I believe this about God that he can and then he doesn't, I am going to feel super disappointed. And I'm not only going to feel like he didn't answer, but I'm going to feel super let down by God. And frankly, I already feel let down by God and by everything else, and I don't want to feel that anymore. I'm really tired. I don't think I can handle that. The truth is what we're left with when it comes to prayer and healing is perhaps more mysterious. Sometimes uh, God heals things in a moment, and other times healing doesn't happen this side of eternity. I've told this story uh, before, and I'll, I'll, for some of you it may be familiar, but I remember um, my last church uh, that I served at, When I got hired, there was another man who got hired named Mike Bennett. Uh, And when I got the call to say, hey, Trey, you officially got this job, the the pastor was like, hey, I just want to let you know the other guy that's getting hired at the same time, we just found out he has a brain tumor. Um, He's like, you don't have one too, do you? And I said, no, of course I don't. (laughs) I'm I'm, okay. Um, Within a couple months, uh, Mike eventually got this uh, more traditional Baptist church to do a service where he prayed over him, anointed him with oil, and prayed over him for healing. And I remember someone asking him after, like, you're saying, Mike, you know, I really hope that worked. And uh, Sarah, do you, do you remember this too? Mike looked at them and said, it did. I've already been healed. Uh, Mike passed away not long at all um, after that. But those words ring true uh, in my soul that sometimes also healing comes in ways that we don't expect or look different than what we think. This leaves us with a deep reality that the world we live in is broken. And I don't know that I have to tell you that as much as you feel it. Things aren't all right. So of course they don't feel all right. You don't feel like everything's great because, I mean, turn on the news, right? Like it's not all great. And we see this in a lot of places. We see this in physical realities. As you get uh, older, you at a certain age, your body doesn't recover as quickly. And Everybody dies, right? It's how it goes. We see this in relational conflict. We see this in psychological conflict, depression, anxiety, mental illness, grief, pain, all of these types of things, and then also in a spiritual sense. We have a disconnect with God, our creator, and also who we are created to be. But what we see is that's not the end of the story. There's a new city that God is making where people of every tribe, nation, and tongue will come together to worship Jesus, where for all who follow Jesus, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death will be no more. But in the meantime, we're given a God who meets us in the midst of it. As uh, Paul Barnett, who's a comment, uh, who writes biblical commentaries, wrote in the message of 2 Corinthians, in practical terms, This means that we have to accept that we live in God's plan B, his plan B world, and that the plan A world is yet to come. And and what he's getting at here is that this world is not all that it's going to be. Things will, don't know exactly when, other than when Jesus returns and makes all things right, things will get better. But right now, things are messed up. He says, in this present world, there is injustice and inequality, and frequently, we are helpless to remedy the evil effects of these in our own lives. In this present existence, we suffer from disorders within our personalities, and though prayer and counseling may minimize them, they are not always removed. In our present lives, many suffer from ill health, mental illness, and disease that are not overcome by either intercession or medication. What are Christians to do in these circumstances of pain and suffering? They are to pray that the Lord will deliver them as Paul did. It may be that God will deliver them as he's continuously doing. We see this in a number of places in scripture. Though all such deliverances are partial, but if not, what then? It's all too easy to allow these things to eat away at our lives until we become embittered and self-pitying. 
Alternatively, it sometimes happened that suffering Christians turn in desperation to those whose teaching on healing fails to acknowledge that we still live in a plan B world. Uh, I, I, as I was prepping for this message, I couldn't help but think of, uh, there's this story in the Gospels, uh, I believe it's recorded in John, um, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus uh, heals a man named Lazarus. Lazarus dies, and there's a story where Jesus goes, and before he raises him from the dead, he weeps. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, which is incredible. But Lazarus died later. Again, right? The, 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 there is a sense in which even if you get the healing now, it's only partial for what God has in store for us. So once again, two kind of temptations. One would be assuming praying will definitely get you the thing that you want. And the second would be not praying uh, and thinking it won't work. Uh, it is honestly mysterious to me why some are healed now and some aren't. It's at times frustrating when I know people who are desperately seeking after the Lord and love God and are praying in faith and walking in community and literally doing all the right things, not just like in the Jesus see, like praying about it sense, but like they're going to therapy, like they're doing all the things. And yet, for whatever reason, God doesn't seem to answer their prayer in the way that they would like. It seems to be a good prayer. I don't understand. So let's get back to this image of the thorn in the flesh. Uh, according to Paul Barnett, this image can either mean a stake which pegged him to the ground, so like a thorn, like a stake, S-T-A-K-E, or a splinter or thorn which constantly irritated him. Perhaps both are being employed. Uh, what we see is kind of a contrast here. Paul had just described this experience of being taken up to heaven, whether in body or out of body, he doesn't know. Whole interesting kind of conversation around that. Um, and he's given this so that he won't become conceited, uh, which according to Paul uh, Barnett, this word there in Greek for conceited can have connotations almost of like being airborne. So he just had this somewhat airborne experience, but rather than this being what is like the most true thing about him, he says God has given him this thing instead, or not God, that something has given him this thing, to stake him down to the ground. And these things that like Paul had experienced would be things that others would boast about. But instead, Paul boasts about weakness, something that seems to knock him to the ground and pin him there. Um, I don't know about you, when you've walked through suffering, don't it sometimes, doesn't it sometimes feel like you are just like knocked down to the ground uh, and then maybe kicked? Um, that's probably fine for me to say this. Uh, I'm looking at my wife. Uh, so I, I don't like telling negative stories about our son. But um, so our son uh, is, we have two sons. One's two, one's two months old. Um, and so Caleb is like so sweet with baby Reed. Uh, but sometimes if Reed is like laying on the floor, we have to watch out because Caleb will come up and just. <laughs> um, I mean, like even if you're right there next to him. And uh, honestly, sometimes it kind of feels like that when you're suffering. You're like stuck on the floor and then it's just like. I'm like, you weren't even mad at me. Why did you have to do this today? <laughs> Things were fine. Uh, but the ironic part about the thorn in the flesh image is something that I think God does in us when the enemy or whatever else means to knock us to the ground and keep us there. I think it brings up a couple images. Two images come to mind. One is that of the image of God, which comes in Genesis, uh, that human beings are made in God's image. And there's some Hebrew uh, word play that goes on in the story of uh, of Genesis talking about humans, that God made human or Adam out of the dust of the ground, or Adam from Adama. So we'll see a bunch of languages in the Old Testament around like you are dust and to dust you will return, that when you get knocked to the ground, part of what it does is it reminds you of your humanity, reminds you of where you will return back to the dust. But in Genesis, we also see a story where how did God make human? He breathed his life into the dust of the ground. And so, what the enemy meant for evil to knock us down, take us out, kick us where it hurts, not that it doesn't hurt anywhere you kick, but you know what I mean. <laughs> the stake on the ground, actually God can take what the enemy meant for evil and use that to breathe life into you and into others, to form you to look more like him. In addition to that, that stake image brings up this image of like Jesus, I, I think, being uh, nailed to a cross. As Paul Barnett said, those in Christ are to allow those thorns to pin them closer to Christ, who imparts grace to the sufferers both to bear the pain and also to develop qualities of endurance and patience. You see, God uses patience to make us more like Christ. 
Though pain does not last forever for those that follow Jesus, we do hear a message of, I believe it was Paul as well, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That there is something that happens as this pain kind of hits us that I recognize my desperate need and as I come in contact with my crucified Savior, he does something to breathe life into death that as I cling close to him, he actually makes me more like him. As another commentary said, uh, relating to this thing too, which is important to note with this weakness imagery, this stake in the flesh is not a confession from Paul of a less than exemplary life. In other words, it's not Paul saying, I don't have gifts to offer. It's not Paul saying, I'm not a gifted writer, I don't know anything. It's not Paul doing that. It actually shows that he is so properly dedicated to the work of the gospel that nothing can distract him. Not even his well-known stake in the flesh. And then we get to this assurance, this incredibly comforting word, and it's twofold. One, that God's grace is sufficient. And that too, the Lord's power is perfected in weakness. It's a message that grace, not sin, righteousness, not death, will have the last word. As the New Living Translation says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Or as the English Standard Version translates it, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all, this is Paul, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So what does this mean? Uh, one, it, it, we are given grace, grace from God, not from ourselves. It's unmerited, unearned, given to us out of God by his goodness and kindness. As Ephesians chapter two says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. That though we have sinned, though we have messed up, though our lives are messed up by all sorts of evil and brokenness, God in his kindness chose to have a relationship with us and those that put our trust in Jesus are able to have a relationship with him and live forever with him. So we see his grace, this unmerited gift that he gives us of life. And it says that it is sufficient. You might also say enough. Okay, God's grace is enough. <sighs> It doesn't really feel like that. Because if it was enough for me, wouldn't I stop crying so much? Wouldn't I feel better? Wouldn't things get better? Let me see the second line. God's power is made perfect in weakness. So uh, that's an interesting line. There's something being made perfect. Uh, one commentary kind of explained it in this way. To, for something to be made perfect means to bring something to its desired end. So that brings up a question. What is its desired end? What is the desired end of God's power in us? People might get a, around a couple of different things, but centering around to know Jesus and to make him known. For you and me to become people of love, who love God with all that we are, and love our neighbors as ourselves, and make disciple-making disciples of Jesus. In essence, to become more like Christ, to be with him, become like him, and do what he did. And so what God does in our weakness is he forms us into Christ-likeness. And then the question also is, what kind of weakness? Uh, Paul here is not referring to, uh, I don't think, just simply things he's not good at. Things that people would say, Paul, you know, you really could uh, become a better, uh, better at your handwriting. Or, Paul, you really could become a better public speaker. Or, Paul, you could really do all these things. That's not what he's getting at. Uh, what he seems to be getting at is, I will boast all the more gladly in my pain and trials and sufferings. I will boast in the things that seem to never go away. So rather than just talking about all the amazing things that he can do, he says, I'm going to talk about how God is sustaining me now, even now when this thorn in my flesh is berating me, constantly beating me, kicking me while I'm on the ground. Even when I don't believe God's grace is sufficient, thank God, it is. And his power is made perfect in weakness. And what we get in this thorn in the flesh image is that God takes what the enemy meant for evil and turns it and uses it for good to bring life. What the enemy meant to kill you, to draw you away from God, God means to do good. It can actually put you into deeper dependence on him. You see, when we, when we suffer, we often run to a bunch of different things. And we're in pain. We run to things that numb it. And sometimes there's a time and place to, you know, distract yourself, uh, because you've you know, done the work. Sometimes we try to distract it. Sometimes we turn into people pleasing or perfectionism. Sometimes we turn to our uh, drug of choice, whether that's Instagram or uh, alcohol or whatever the thing is, um, and, and abuse, abuse something. But if instead we allow it to turn us into Christ-likeness and being pinned closer to Christ, God does a transformative work within us. As Paul Barnett said, it is some mysterious way 
uh, that within God's plan, our present existence is marked by sin and suffering. And from one point of view, God abhors and hates these things and will one day overthrow them. And yet, is it not through the awareness of our sins that the grace of God holds us near Christ for forgiveness right through our lives? And is it not also in the pain of the suffering of both body and mind that the same grace pins us closer to Christ who says to us, my power is made perfect in weakness? If you look at a person uh, who is mature in their faith, a person who is godly, a person who loves people well, a person who is like patient and kind and gentle, who's lived a life, my strong assumption would be that they have walked through something incredibly painful and may still be. God does something in us, even in those really terrible things. Uh, and, and I want to be careful here, too. I'm, I'm not trying to glorify uh, suffering either. I don't wish it upon anyone. Uh, sometimes it just happens. But God does something in it. So why does he boast in weakness? We're told, uh, so that the power of Christ may rest on him. What does that mean? He may be here drawing on Old Testament imagery of the tabernacle, which is the place where God's presence was said to particularly dwell amongst his people. And then it also, we see that fast forwarded into John chapter one, where the word became flesh and dwelt among us, or Jesus was like tabernacled amongst us. Wherever Jesus went, his presence went. So wherever he went, he would forgive sins, he would heal people of diseases, cast out demons, a bunch of other things. Um, and then we see in Revelation a picture where God will make his dwelling amongst his people. And so Paul seems to be drawing on these like large themes. And what it seems to be an invitation of is if you want to encounter God's presence, it's actually through weakness, coming to God in pain. So as I invite the band to come up, come up a few things about suffering. One, God suffers. This is demonstrated through Jesus in a number of other places, God being compassionate, which means suffers with us. Secondly, uh, God meets us in our suffering, that he's near to the brokenhearted. Uh, third, God will defeat suffering forever. For those that follow Jesus, we are promised that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and that death will be no more. And what good news for those of us whose lives have been marked by both of those things. Fourth, God gives perspective through suffering, that the world is broken and desperately need God. I need God. I, I desperately need him. And fifth, that God forms us through suffering like a fire. I heard a, a pastor uh, talking to a group of uh, ministers, and I don't remember the statistics, but it's kind of uh, crazy how many ministers and pastors get like burnt out in ministry. And it, one of his points was, uh, in suffering, suffering can do one of two things. It can either burn you out or it can burn you clean. So let it burn you clean rather than allowing it to pin you to all of these other things that you will want to find yourself pinned to, allow it to pin you to the ground and pin you to Christ, to draw you into Christ-likeness, to recognize your desperate need for him. And when you, feel, when you feel forgotten, when you feel forsaken, when you feel like there is no, uh, no hope, reminded of the words Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If that's you, I want you to, I encourage you, um, even as we sing these songs, to like bring that to God. He says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This is Psalm 22. Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. And he goes on to say this, yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. Uh, another version of this thing is the King James talks about the Lord inhabiting the praises of his people. Uh, that there is something about uh, when we bring our weaknesses, our struggles, our pain points, these desperation places in our lives that it feels like God could never meet us in. There's something that happens in there that Christ's power comes in them in a particular profound sort of way. That I think the invitation for us today in our walk with God is not to come to him and say, all right, God, uh, here I am and here's all the things that I can offer. What's that place in your life that you're like, I don't think this literally ever will get better. 
And maybe you've even prayed about it and you just feel like, oh my God, my God, like why have you forsaken me? I cry out to you all the time and yet you just seem to have turned a deaf ear to me and I am frustrated. I think the invitation today is to bring that to God. And as we lift those up to him, I believe that God makes his presence uh, known in our lives. And for some in this room, you may feel it. Uh, For others of us in the room, you will say that and you will feel absolutely nothing. And that's pretty normal. But there is something about when we bring these things to God that we can boast in, in our weakness because Christ's power is made perfect in it. And so that Christ may rest upon us. So my invitation for us as I I pray is that as we sing uh, these songs um, and as we stand and do that, that you take whatever posture you need to to bring these things to God. Uh, For you, like me, if that's depression or anxiety, bring that to Him. If you're walking through a season of unanswered prayer, bring that to Him. Uh, If you're walking through some physical illness or relational conflict that just seems like it will never get better, bring it to Him. Um, And my hope for the time that you're doing it is not that God's going to give you some profound answer that will make it all better, although I hope that happens for some of you in the room. But I just pray in a mysterious way that only God can, that He meets you in the place of your deepest weakness, of your deepest pain, of your deepest struggle. He's not forgotten you. He's not forsaken you. Hebrews 13, 5 says He will never leave you or forsake you. So will you lift these up as as an offering to God? Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much um, for who you are. Thank you for being a God who doesn't forget us in our pain or our weakness, but meets us there. Um, Lord, I pray that you will um, help us to be honest with you. Um, And maybe for some in the room, God, that honesty with you is like, I don't think I believe in you. I don't know that I do. Um, God, I just pray that people will be bold in bringing that to you. Um, yeah, what's the, what's the worst that happens? <laughs> and so, God, I just pray that you would uh, allow us to be bold with you and bring these things to you, our places of deepest weakness. And God, for some in the room, I just pray that they just sense like a burden off them. Um, even if just that's in the sense of knowing that they're not alone, even if the thorn in the flesh still remains, that they really do deeply hear the words uh, that you spoke to Paul come true in their life, that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so God, in us, through our pain, through the good, through the bad, through all of it, will you form us to look more like you? And so God, we, we bring these things to you. Uh, just, uh, we need you. Um, we, we need you to show up. Um, God, I'm just reminded, like, if I come here and I preach and I talk about you, if we come here and we just sing about you, Lord, it's, it's, what, what's the point if you're not here? God, we want you. We want more of your presence. And, and uh, God, so, God, I just pray right now in this moment, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would make your presence known amongst us. Um, there's a variety of places in their faith journey. God, would you just um, speak to us as we bring these dark, uh, weak places to you? May the power of Christ rest on on us. For when we are weak, then we are strong. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching the service. We pray that it blessed you and helped you grow closer to God. If you are in the Nashville area, we'd love for you to join us sometime. If you're not in the Nashville area, we'd love to help you get connected with the local church if you don't already have one. We pray that God blesses you this week and that he grows you closer in your relationship with him and with your community, that he uses you in a powerful way to be a vessel of his good news in everywhere that you go. May God bless you.